Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty with Father's Heart Ministry. This is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. Today is Friday, and as is our custom, we don't talk about offerings or promotional things throughout the week, but we do take Friday uh, to uh, mention two important things to us. Number one, many of our partners listen to the Morning Light broadcast, and so because you're listening, we want to say thank you. Thank you. We'd say thank you whether you were listening or not, but we know you listen, and we want to thank you, thank you, thank you yes, glory for to God. your financial support of Father's Heart Ministry. And for those of you that just haven't taken that opportunity, I want to uh, uh, put that in front of you to ask the Lord if this broadcast is a benefit to you. Ask the Lord uh, what you can do by way of reciprocity. We sow to you spiritual things, the Bible says. It's fitting to sow back natural things. And uh, just ask the Lord what that might be. And by all means, when you donate, you can go to the website, propheticnow.com, fathersartministry.net. Be sure and mention in the comment of your donation, mention Morning Light. Uh, because that's one way that we, we quantify, uh, yes, we... We're, we're getting through. Uh, I just want to mention, too, for those of you who send in contributions by mail, uh, we moved that P.O. box from Springfield to Branson, which is right a couple blocks away from our home, our post office box. So if you wouldn't mind, check on the website and look for the current Branson P.O. box for your giving because there's many of you out there that send in offerings in an envelope, and it would be great if we can take care of that business at the same time. Now, one other thing is when we started doing the morning light broadcast uh, it's the Lord told me he said the day will come that it will be as successful and well known as the daily prophetic word which goes out to 22,000 people every day and uh, the broadcast is growing and we do have uh, a listenership but uh, I just so depend on you to share. The, if a broadcast really touches your heart, it means something to you, or you know a friend that could benefit by a particular teaching, there's a share button, there's a like button. You can copy and paste the URL into your Facebook or email it to someone or tell somebody about the morning light because we don't do any advertising, any promotional uh, campaigns at all to tell people we're out here. And so it's totally dependent upon you. And I just uh, ask that you do that. As important as your donations are to help us uh, do what we do, that is equally as important. Also, I want you to know, because those of you that work in the chat box with us, and it's so fun to be able to glance at that and stay focused uh, on what we're doing here, but we totally love it. And you you need to know there's sixty about 60 people that are watching live, listening live, rather, to, at the same time you are, so you know you've got a family out there that's bigger. But on average, we have at least 300 people that in the course of 24 hours and then into the next week that will listen to Morning Light, so 300 people gleaning from that. So it's like we're a congregation of about uh, 360 people. It's just so exciting to know you're out there. Good morning and God bless you. So we're going to Deuteronomy chapter 28 today. Blessed coming in and blessed going out. You know, there are consequences of being in relationship with Christ. In this chapter, the parameters of God's blessing in your life is minutely defined around every action and every circumstance you might find yourself in. Likewise, there is a description of what estrangement from God looks like and and consequences in order to motivate us to not allow that to happen, to maintain or to restore fellowship as as needed. Mm -hmm. Uh, It just speaks to me that that things are the way they are and this is how God uh, talks to me uh, consistently. When I'm asking God why or I'm uncomfortable or this isn't convenient for me, the Lord says uh, things are the way they are because of what you're doing. If you want something different, you have to do something different. Luke 17, 20, and 21 says, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, and the kingdom of God is within you. Mm -hmm. And so we have to do something. If you're a hearer but not a doer, uh, that is the definition. That is the equivalent. Hearing but not doing is the equivalent of deception from the biblical definition. And so we, we want to bear that in mind. Now, in this chapter, 
Moses continues to rehearse, and I'm just going to make some opening remarks on this before we start reading, because we don't want, you know, we look at this and we quote all those bus coming in, bus going out. Well, that's 14 verses of a 70 verse chapter, the remainder of which cursed be and cursed this and cursed that. <laughs> and, uh, and so how do we approach this? If we delight in the blessing and expect the blessing by, by inference, we're accepting the rest uh, of the chapter as well. And the Bible says this is the, the law of sin and death. The, the law, being weak through the flesh, could never bring man into a right relationship with God. So we're going to look at this chapter from a little bit different perspective. This chapter is one of the most quoted and least quoted chapters in the Bible. We rejoice in verses 1 through 14, but the remainder of the chapter uh, tends to get uh, neglected. I would say Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, after John 3, 16, that's probably the most, one of the top 10 most quoted verses uh, in the Bible, particularly for Pentecostal, charismatic, word of faith, prophetic people. I think so. Um, so we rejoice in verses 1 through 14, but what about the remainder of the chapter? It's very sobering because it describes the calamity of a people that forget their God. So in that context, you know, uh, it's good to be reminded of the purpose of the law, lest we forget. Galatians 3.24 says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The blessings are there to bring us to Christ. The curses are there to bring us to Christ. They serve a singular purpose. Now, why, okay, you're blessed if you're moving toward God in obedience. You're cursed if you neglect God in disobedience. Why is that even an issue? Because when man fell, let's go all the way back to the fall. When man fell, it was due to the temptation that the enemy gave of being like God, independent of God. And God's solution to that, that was the infection of the sin nature. Being like God, independent of God, not needing God, not having someone over you, over you like God. See, Genesis 3, 5, the enemy told Adam and Eve, for God knows in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened and you will be as God's knowing both good and evil. Well, they knew good and evil before that because anything God said was good, anything God didn't say was evil. It's what Jesus said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If they didn't know right from wrong, they could not have been judged as being in sin when they disobeyed. They knew what obedience was. They knew what disobedience was. So it's talking about being like God, independent of God. Uh, judging your life or your value or your self-worth by an independent standard, independent of God's point of view. And, uh, and this caused not only disobedience to the first couple, but it resulted when they had children. The children were then born mortal. They would die, number one. But they were also born with a sin nature that reflected the same fracture that provoked Adam and Eve to want to be like God, independent of God. And that fracture was already there, or it wouldn't have been an effect of temptation. So where did the fall start? Now, just going a little deep, right off the bat. <laughs> where did the fall start? There was some fracture in Adam and Eve before. The Bible says she was already in the deception. If you go read it, it said she was already in the deception. If you study out what the New Testament says about the temptation, Psalm 51, 1, David said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. It actually says that uh, Eve was in the deception, but Adam was not deceived, which means he did what he did with his eyes wide open. He knew exactly what the consequences were. Ouch. <laughs> and then had the audacity to say, as men have repeated for 6,000 years, that woman you gave me. Come on, brother, preach it. And why are you hiding yourself? Well, God, if you weren't so scary, I wouldn't have to. Uh -uh. You see the, the sin nature? Mm. Behold, I was shapen in sin, David said, and in sin did my mother conceive me. In other words, we we're born with the sin nature. And because we are born with the sin nature, God gave the law, in essence, to afford us the opportunity to attain, if possible, Connect perfection, perfection independent of grace. 
It's like man says, I can do, be like God, independent of God, make up my own, God, own mind. God gave us the law 4, 000, for 4,000 years and said, how's that working for you? Oh, you need a savior. Okay, well, let me send Jesus. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. God gave the law, in essence, to afford man the opportunity to attain perfection independent of divine grace. It was his purpose to activate in us a conscience and give us his perfect law in order to convince us of our need of a Savior. Romans 8.3 For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God in sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. What did he condemn? The sin nature that was condemning us. He con he wasn't condemning sin like you, sinner. No, you don't understand. He condemned the sin that was condemning you. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like when you condemn a house, you can't live there anymore. Right. Jesus, by grace, came and condemned sin as something that you would have to live in the rest of your life. He condemned sin. He put the sticker on front of the door. This house is condemned. Now you come on over to my house. Come he on. condemned sin. Amen. But he has to convince us that there's somewhere else to live. Yeah. So he sent the law and says, how's that working for you? And he didn't evict us. He adopted us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amen. So the blessings in the first 14 verses are not simply offered as a carrot and stick incentive for obedience, but as the sure promise of the fruits of walking in the character of God in our lives, which ultimately is not attainable by human nature, but by the impartation of grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. we got to come at this a little different, because if you just come at it as, yes, if I'm a good little boy or a good little girl, I'm going to be blessed going in, blessed going out, blessed in my basket, blessed in my store, because if you just approach it that way, you have to swallow hook, line, and sinker the 50-some-odd verses that come after that, cursed be, cursed be, cursed be. There is something deeper at work here. Mm. So, Kitty, if you would begin by reading the first 14 verses, and we're just going to have a hallelujah fit as you read them. Okay, well, have have your hallelujah fits. I have to sit still and concentrate. Okay, verse 1, Deuteronomy 28, And it shall come to pass that if thou shalt hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command you this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. Now, it's not just the voice through Moses. It's the voice that was talking all the way back to the garden. Adam, where are you? Mm -hmm. That voice is resonating through every person born with a sin nature all the way down to the day of Pentecost. Wow. The scripture said they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. And if you look at another rendering of that, it means they heard the sound of the Lord God whirling upon the breezes. And it's the same sound that burst like a mighty wind into the upper room on the day of Pentecost. The, the God who was a fire from his loins up and from his loins down, he burst into that place by his wind and offered the 120 the same transaction that he offered Adam. And Adam just wanted to talk about how scary he was and give me back my fig leaf. And they said, we'll take it, sir. Yes, amen. Didn't they do it? Verse 2. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. And if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy ground, yes. and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. Yes. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. You're not my enemy, are you? God fights against my enemies. Amen. <laughs> there you go. Don't Say that to the devil. Yeah. <laughs> they shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. And the Lord shall command the blessings upon thee in thy storehouse and in all that thou settest thy hand unto. And he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And the Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself, as he has sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his and ways. And so who is his way? Is his way Mosaic law? And let's go join a Messianic congregation. Mm -hmm. Or Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. Put on the mind of Christ and walk in Christ and let him walk in you. Amen. Agreed. And all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. Let me just say, they're going to see when you prosper and you're in good health and all your needs are met and you've got more than enough in store to give away to every good work that you see, the people are going to see that you're called by the name of the Lord. That's my additional uh, comment. <laughs> 
Um, verse 11, And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle, in the fruit of the ground, in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. And the Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure. Now where's the land? He said everywhere you put your foot, I've given it to you. So if you're putting your foot somewhere today, unless you got up walking on your hands, you're in the land which the Lord thy God has promised to give you. Amen. And the Lord shall open unto thee his good treasures, the heaven, to give rain unto thy land in a season, and to bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend to many, let us emphasize, thou shalt lend to many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If that thou hearken unto the commandment of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day, to observe and to do them. So. Verse 14, you said? Did I say? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. External dependencies. Mm, good. As we walk in an uncompromised relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, these blessings become the definition of God's blessings in our lives. Now, God places no premium upon suffering. Amen. With the advent of monastic Christianity in the second century, the vow of celibacy, the vow of poverty, mm -hmm. the, the Christian religion has set a premium as though God delights in you suffering what Jesus died to take off of you. Mm -hmm. But we have to come back to the baseline of what the scripture teaches. God never chooses suffering for mankind. Suffering is a reality because of a chosen rejection of relationship with God from sinful man. John Milton in Paradise Lost, he expressed perfectly the quintessential heart of rebellion. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. That's what the world says. The world would rather, remember in the book of Revelation, it says men will be so tormented that they will cry for the rocks to fall on them, but, as, but in the midst of doing that, they're shaking their fist and cursing God in the heavens. Because they'd rather live in rebellion. They would rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. But man was created for fellowship with God. Now listen to me. Get your snorkel gear. Check your oxygen tank. Adjust your regulator. Put your seat in the upright position. <laughs> it's a sad fact that is seen when we read in Genesis 2.2 that Adam could not find a helper suitable. To him again what was the fracture in Adam and Eve that made them susceptible to temptation it was already there or they couldn't have been tempted mm. remember this that originally man and woman were one being so this is talking about more than just gender is it not telling us what um, in eight versions of the Bible, John 14, 26 describes the Holy Spirit as a helper. How come God didn't create them initially separated? Why did he make them one being? Because he was wanting to present himself as a helper to them. You know, God doesn't make anything broken. God doesn't make anything unfit. God doesn't make anything suitable. There was a suitable helper to whatever man was. Remember, he was not a man by gender, it was man and woman together. Man was something else. In the image of God. If you study in the scriptures, <laughs> he was he was a a creature of light. He was a fire from his loins up and from his loins down. He was something that we cannot rightly imagine in our thinking. But he would but he was one. And but yet God created him. He is, was one that needed a helper. And he wasn't getting it. And so God paraded every single animal in front of him and began to show him that every animal was created in need of a helper. And he's sitting right there at, with God and saying, "There's uh, all of these have helpers, but I don't have a helper. And God's sitting right there next to him. And it's just like what happened in John chapter 5 when Jesus went to the pool of Bethesda. When he went to the pool of Bethesda, there was a man there who was impotent, mm -hmm. and he couldn't. He said, "I have no man to put me in at the troubling of the waters." And Jesus asked him, he "says Will you be made whole? <laughs> Will you be made whole?" And he didn't get it. Jesus was there as his helper, 
but he rejected. See, when God took Eve from Adam, he didn't create a unity. He created a separation. <laughs> Say it again. When God created Adam, when he separated Adam from Eve, he didn't create a unity. He created a separation, and we've been trying to close that gap ever since. Isn't that the truth? Let me say it again. <laughs> when God took Eve from Adam, he didn't create a unity. He created a separation, and we've been trying to close that gap ever since. Mm -hmm. And all the while, God has been speaking to us in 4,000 years of scripture and psalm and poetry about the bride and the bridegroom relationship of man and God. And in Ephesians 5, he says, I speak a mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and his church. Amen. Amen. And just chew on that. Just, just let that sink down in your ear. Just meditate on that. See, in that context, we understand that oneness with, with God has consequences. And conversely, it can only be that the rejection of our created purpose to allow him to be our helper must also have consequences, even though God would never choose that for us. God did not choose for Adam and Eve to be in that place of fracture susceptible to relationship because the scripture says he tempts no man. That's right. But he hadn't figured it out yet. Mm -hmm. He had to have something external to himself. It wasn't enough to be one with God before the fall. He had to have something external to himself. And external dependency is idolatry. How many of you have ever seen a, a spouse or a boyfriend or a girlfriend be an idol to someone? Yeah. And they would forsake their relationship with God just to have that person in their life. And let me add here, what is God saying to us today, even the word of the year that you posted, was make my presence your priority. He's been trying to get us back to himself because he's a jealous God. So what it started out to be is what he wants to bring it back to be in all restoration. It's us becoming so intimate with him that they can't tell us and Jesus apart walking down the street. So what does that look like? It looks like what the scripture talks about when Jesus is suddenly going to take to himself a bride without spot or wrinkles. Yes. If you want to know what it looks like in the heavens, I'm not sure what it's going to look I got an idea what it'll look like in the natural, but go to Revelations chapter 12, and it says, Suddenly there appears in the heavens a sun-clothed woman, great with child. Jesus doesn't have pregnancy, have sex before marriage. That's right. Before conception, there must be a marriage that is consummated. Mm -hmm. And here's the church as a sun-clothed woman, great with child and brings forth there's and you can we could preach on that for days but we're not going to but we're living why is that important because folks we're living in the bridal season amen we're living in, in the bridal season where we're moving into that iteration that version of god's people upon the earth that will be typified and descriptive of a bride being taken by her bridegroom and the prophetic and the minister specifically the prophetic like john the baptist said we are the friend of the bridegroom saying behold the bridegroom cometh amen even so come lord jesus <laughs> see matthew 24 41 says that hell was made for the devil and his angels hell That's was right. not made for man and there's something in man that understands that, but yet doesn't want to yield to a sovereign God. So we conclude there is no hell, no devil. And, and that thinking has invaded evangelical Christianity. No hell, no devil, no eternal punishment. Mm -hmm. You really have to do violence to the scriptures to get that. If that's true, that's functional atheism. That means that if God cannot be grieved, if God can be grieved, there's consequences. If God cannot be grieved, then God is not a personal God, and the agnostics, the Greek philosophers upon which the Western world and Western thought is built on, believe that there is no way God isn't even aware that you exist because he's God. Mm. And he's not even conscious of anything to do with you. And unfortunately, the early church fathers trying to convince pagan philosophers and, Rome, and Roman emperors said that we're just worshiping the God of the ancient philosophers who didn't even believe in a personal God. <laughs> and here we are, his very own creation, made but, in his image. But hell was not made for the devil or his angels. And Second Peter 3, 9, now we have people say, yes, God, God put this cancer on me so I could be a testimony to my nurses and to my doctors. Well, wait a minute. 
2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life. And everlasting life does not begin at death, because death is an enemy. See, religion teaches that death is a facilitator to glory. But the Bible plainly says death is an enemy. God, Death is an angel. It's a demonic angel, and God does not need a demon to perfect you, to bring you to glory, to give you everything <laughs> Jesus died for you to have. Amen. He's not willing for you to perish, Second Peter 3, 9. So he's not willing for you to be sick. He's not willing for you to be broke. He's not willing for you to be devastated, unhappy, disturbed. Anything in your life that does not fit the footprint of life and life more abundantly is something that Jesus died to get off of you. Amen. What a Savior. <laughs> what a Savior. He places no premium upon suffering. Nonetheless, in order to give man autonomy to choose, that choice and its consequences had to be available or all of humanity and the whole idea of freedom and power of choice is just a divine farce. Therefore, there are consequences. There are consequences. When we openly or obliquely, by inference, reject God. And the people said, Amen. And now we come to <laughs> verse 14 through 69. Some of the least quoted <laughs> scriptures in the Bible. And I want, Kitty, I just want you to read through the entire chapter down to the end. And I just want you to hear without judgment. Mm. I, I don't want you to judge yourself. I don't want you to throw rocks at your chat partner. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, that's good for Latista. Latista needs to hear that. Thank you, Jesus, that she tuned in today. No way. I know I don't need to hear that. But no Latista way. Latista really needs that. <laughs> he loves you, Latista. <laughs> no. See, to the degree we level blame, we establish our own guilt. Yep. To the degree that we sense, yes, that's really good for. I'm so glad they're listening. We're a, that's the measurement of our own uh, lack of good conscience before that's God. Right. Help us, God. But let's just. Let's just listen to this as that which is God-breathed, and then we're going to make some comments at the end of it. Go ahead. Verse 15. But, there's a big but there. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all of his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, the fruit of thy land, increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed thou shalt thou be when thou come in and when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, rebuke, in all that thou settest thy hand to do, until thou be destroyed and until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he have consumed thee from off the land, whether thou goest in to possess it. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever and with inflammation and extreme burning and with sword and with blasting and mildew, and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. And the Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven it shall come down upon thee, until thou be destroyed. And the Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them, and flee seven ways before them, and shall be removed in removed into all the kingdoms of the earth that's scattered and thy carcass shall be meat unto all the fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the earth and no man shall fray them away and the lord will smite thee with the botch of egypt and with the emrods and with scab and with the itch whereof thou cannot be healed and the lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart and thou shalt grope at noonday and as the blind gropeth in darkness, and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt only be oppressed and spoiled evermore, no man shall save thee. Thou shalt betroth a wife, and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build a house, and thou shalt not dwell in therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shalt not gather the grapes thereof. How many of you are ready to holler calf rope right about now? Help like my us. grandpa would arm wrestle somebody and said, I'm going to get a hold of you and make you holler calf rope, you know? Yeah. Uncle. Yeah, I'd say, Uncle, a few verses back already. 
Verse 31, Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, and thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine ass will be violently taken away from before thy face, and thou shalt not be restored. Carjacking. <laughs> Carjacking. <laughs> Cute, honey. And shall not be restored unto thee. Thy sheep shall be given unto thine enemies. Thou shalt have none to rescue them. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto an <clears throat> another people, and thine eyes shall look and fail. And sorry, sorry, your, your eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all day long. And there shall be no might in thine hand. The fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall the nation which thou knowest not eat up, <clears throat> and thou shalt only be oppressed and crushed away, so that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. The Lord shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs and the sore botch that cannot be healed from the sole of thy foot to the top of thy head. The Lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have, give, have known. And there, shall, there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all the nations where the Lord shall lead thee. Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field, and shalt gather but little in, for the locusts shall consume it. <coughs> thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but neither shalt drink the wine, nor the grapes thereof, for the worms shall eat them. Thou shalt have olive trees in all thy coasts, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil. Thine olive shall cast his fruit. Thou shalt beggest beget sons and daughters and thou shalt not enjoy them for they shall go into captivity and all thy trees and the fruit of thy land shall the locusts consume the stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high and thou shalt come down very low he shall lend to thee and thou shalt not lend to him and he shall be the head and thou shalt be the tail moreover all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue and overtake thee till thou be destroyed because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his Adam, commandments. Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? To keep his commandments and statutes which he commanded thee. And they shall be upon thee for a sign and a wonder and upon the, thy seed forever. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger thirst, nakedness, and want of all things, and he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. Judgments, opinions. Isn't that what the church is suffering under right now? The Amen. opinions of the world encroaching Amen. upon our freedoms? Right. Ver 49. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from afar, uh -oh, from the ends of the earth, as swift as eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of old, nor show the favor to the young. He shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, oil, or the increase of your kind or flocks of sheep until he have destroyed thee. And he shall besiege all thee and all thy gates until the high fenced walls come down wherein thou trusted throughout the land, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout the land with the, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. Makes me think thee. about airport gates. Oh, gates of the airports. And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine and thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee in siege and in straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee. So that the man that is tender among you and very delicate, his eye shall be evil towards his brother and towards the wife of his bosom and toward the remnant of his children which he shall leave. So that he will not give any of them of any, to any of them of the flesh of his children whom he shall eat, because he hath nothing left, in, left him in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in all thy gates. The tender and the delicate woman among you, which would not adventure to set sole of her foot on the ground for delicateness and tenderness, her eyes shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom, and toward her son, and toward her daughter, and toward her young one that cometh out from between her feet, and toward her children, which she shall bear. For she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege, and in straightness, wherewith the enemy shall distress thee in thy gates. If thou wilt not observe to do the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God, 
the then the Lord will make thy plague wonderful and plagues of thy seed even great plagues and of long continuance and sore sickness and of long continuance moreover he shall bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt which <coughs> thou waste which thou waste afraid of or wast afraid of and they shall cleave unto thee also every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law then will the Lord bring unto thee until thou be destroyed and ye shall be left few in number whereas you were as stars of the heaven for a multitude because thou wouldst not obey the voice of the Lord thy God and it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and multiply you so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught, and ye shall be plucked off the land, whether thou goest to possess it. And the Lord shall scatter thee among the people, and from the end of the earth even into the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither know, neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shall find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord thy God shall give thee a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear the day day and night, and have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt thou shalt say, Would God it were even, and at even thou wouldst say shall say, Would God it were morning, for the fear of thine heart wherewith thy thou shalt fear, and for thine eyes which thou shalt see. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships by the way whereof I spoke unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more, and there you shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. Now how many can rejoice with me and say, Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for <laughs> Jesus. See, this <laughs> is what us. it looks like without a day's man without an advocate remember they had no advocate it was like metal on metal no oil in the engine no transmission fluid in the transmission uh, it was just coming up face up to man's uh, sinful nature uh, coming into accountability to a holy God who can be like we said yesterday don't grieve the Holy Ghost who can be grieved but then there's Jesus mm. where Jesus said the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all Amen. this is why in the first three centuries of the church there were very strong movements that came out saying that this God in Deuteronomy 28 is not the one that sent Jesus to die they could not reconcile this God hmm. to the God that sent his only begotten son and what they did is they looked at Genesis 1 and 2 and they saw Elohim and then after in Genesis 3 on they saw Jehovah and they decided that Jehovah was a lesser God that Elohim usurped and sent Jesus to die and you think that sounds a little strange but there were movements that lasted for centuries that competed with the church that the apostles established for the control and the character of what Christianity would ultimately become but you know those thoughts are still there functionally by inference by how we deal with because we don't want to look at these so by our neglect of these passages and what they imply we're embracing the same thinking oh that's not the God that's not my Savior that's mm -hmm. not my Jesus that's not and we functionally deny the full character of the Lord our God his sovereignty his sovereignty and this was given Galatians 3 24 or say that with me the law is my schoolmaster to bring me to Christ the law is my schoolmaster to bring me to Christ he's not there to destroy you he's not mm -hmm. there to harm you. he's trying to bring you to himself he's trying to mend what got broken when man decided uh, Adam and Eve decided they wanted to be like God independent of God when man, when God dealt with Adam and brought him every single animal in uh, creation trying to get Adam to see hey they have a helper I need a helper and John 14 26 says the Holy Ghost is the helper and he still didn't get it he he couldn't it was like the man at the pool of Bethesda Jesus is standing right there sir I have no man to put me in the water to get to get healed and we do the same thing we got Jesus in our heart we're waiting on a revival mm. 
We're begging God for a visitation. We're ignoring the habitation of who he is on the inside of us. It's the same thinking. We still don't get it. It's the sin nature that cannot be content with who he is, cannot find who he is within us sufficient to the need. And so we look outward, and every outward dependence has the seeds of idolatry and fallen nature in it that produces the consequences of that choice. Like Adam. Like he was Adam. looking outward. He was looking outward. Instead of inside. <laughs> wow. That takes us back. Wow. I'm sure, and I know that's that's a little bit way of looking, different way of looking at things. You hadn't heard it like that before, I would imagine. And I just challenge you to look into scriptures and to see if these things be so. Amen. See, things are the way they are because of what we're doing. If we want something different, we have to do something different. If we're going to do something different, we're doing what we do because of how we think. And so if you're going to do something different, you have to begin to think differently. Amen. And so we have to begin to prep. That's why I'm more comfortable with my questions than I am with everybody else's answers. That's right. Because everybody else's answers is producing the high watermark of what people think God is doing in the earth. And it's not higher than a sewer to me. I am not satisfied with what I see. I'm not willing to um, explain away and equivocate why the God of 2015 is not manifesting his kingdom in the earth as the God of Adam and Eve and Elijah and Jesus and so forth. I believe we're intended to live life uh, in the manifestation of a New Testament character. Amen. And we're not there and I'm not willing to explain it away with dispensationalism or some sort of doctrinal nuance as to why we're really okay and just hold on till Jesus comes. No. We have to begin to think differently. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Yes. We are sons and daughters of God. Oh, Father God, come and close the gap. Consummate your marriage. Become mm -hmm. one with us. You are sufficient to us. We don't want to look to any outward thing for that which we should be finding our dependence in you. That would be idolatry. <laughs> because outside, that outward dependence garners consequences in our lives that these verses, um, these verses portray. And I don't want that for me. And I don't want that... Uh, for you. Thank you, Lord. So I'm sure you would agree in examining this chapter that we want to live in the first 14 chapter, 14 yes. verses. Amen. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not the remaining passages. So what then is the value of the remaining passages? Listen to me. They are a sobering instrument of discernment in our lives in the light of the scriptural filter. Let me say it again. They are a sobering instrument of discernment. What is your life characterized? Is your life characterized more by verse 15 through 68 or verse 1 through 14? Now, there could be any one instance. You, you could say, you know, you, you went down the road, got in a car accident, wound up in the hospital in traction for a week. Well, you just dirty center you. Mm -hmm. Well, not necessarily. We live in a fallen world. Right. However, what if your life is characterized your lifetime is characterized by verses 15 through 68 yes. rather than verses 1 through 14. Then we should be mature enough and humble enough to say, ain't nothing wrong, but something ain't right. Amen. See, the, the Hebrews 4 says the word of God is a discerner. Oh, that's condemnation. Well, you just keep on saying that to yourself and living in defeat and living a, 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 in a religion of victi victimology. God wants something more for you. The life of a believer. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and the life have more abundantly. If that is not the consistent characterization of your life, the kingdom of God doesn't come with observation. Therefore, things are the way they are because of what we're doing. If you want something different, you have to do something different. If you're going to do something different, you must first think differently because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Amen. So we have to begin to roll back, to let go of the principles and the foundation stones of our life that is producing what we know and be willing to look at our life and take the word of God and let the word of God discern you. Discerning your life in the light of the scriptural filter. I know that is Amen. meat for men and quite frankly most people aren't capable of it. It's just a fact. Most people don't want to be, be look at their life with that level of scrutiny. Things are the way they are because of what we're doing. God has provided a pathway 
and it's not messianic judaism sure. it's jesus saying i'm the way i'm the truth i'm the life it's not doctrine it's not knowledge he said you'll go out with joy be led forth with peace not go out with a great book and a great teaching here's the key to breakthrough no the teaching is only helpful in fact the teaching the best most anointed teaching you'd ever hear will be total deception in your life unless you act on it amen it's what you do with what you know that produces breakthrough and what you do is based upon what you're thinking and if what is being taught isn't breaking through to shape and formatively shape your thinking then nothing changes amen brother god has provided a pathway to blessing and benefit if our life is not descriptive of abundance and blessing as defined by verses 1 through 14, then we must in all, what we do is we, we presume, yes, I know that's what the Bible says, but God always says his prayer, but sometimes he says no. That is a heretical doctrine from the pit of hell. And it is said which, with such pathos mm -hmm. and such compassion and such empathy by well-meaning pastors by well-meaning ministers, by well-meaning Christians trying to pat somebody on the head with tears running down their face. You know, you'll understand it better by and by, but it is a lie from the pit of hell right. that is robbing you of your blessing and robbing you of your victory. See, we must in all humility examine our lives by the minute and refined filter of the scripture. If our life is more descriptive of verses 15 through 68 then we need to go look at the condition that produces that and ask ourselves the difficult question are we listening to the voice of our lord our god or are we doing something else come on we all have to do it we all have to examine our hearts and see what's in there see he gives the first 14 verses because he leads with goodness mm -hmm. god always leads with goodness it's the goodness of god that leads men to repent right. but where there is no repentance then there are other conditions that kick in, not as it means that God delighting to destroy you, mm -hmm. but as God's trying to turn us back to his goodness. One thing I've always known about God, it's when he is ready to reveal the pollution in our life, he has the solution standing right there next to it. And you opt in for his solution, and it's easier to let go of those things that you thought would be acceptable and okay. So in all humility, we have to examine our hearts. It's I can't, you know, the Quakers they used to examine each other's hearts. Ouch! <laughs> That's why we had the Salem witch trials. How many of you have been a uh, uh, been before in charismatic inquisitions? Okay. How many of you have been? You know, it's amazing. You know, if you want to go somewhere where you're unconditionally accepted, loved, and, and believed in, you know, it's probably going to be a bar and not a church, because the church is not an accepting environment. Because we, we, we know we need, we have the conviction that examination needs to take place, so let me examine someone else because I'm not about to examine myself. But we need to examine ourselves. Amen. We need to look to ourselves. And, uh, and I believe we're not, we're not always going to be hounding and pounding away at the church for that. We've just seen the demise of so many people's lives and in the church. But the church is not that church that God's coming for. Yeah. He's coming for that church that submits to him, that gets back to the Adam principle and loves him with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength. And that's the church he's coming back after, a glorious bride. And, and that's the one he, he finds himself in. He recognizes himself. And he comes for himself. Yeah, the definitions drift. What what we call church in Christian culture is mm. not necessarily what God was referring to when He speaks of it. Amen. And that's that's a sobering thought. He has to see himself. <laughs> Amen. So repent quickly. Yes. Repent Lord. quickly. Seek a place of forgiveness. Just ask yes. the Lord. See, they couldn't seek a place of forgiveness. They were going to pay the price. Lord. You and I have a days man. We have a mediator. We have Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And we could turn to Jesus, and He said, He turned to Him, and He says, "I got this," <laughs> because all of this wrath was poured out upon Jesus Thank upon you, the cross. Jesus. All of this, from <laughs> verse 15 to verse 68, was poured out in a caustic acid upon Jesus, mm. upon the cross. Mm. Well, how come I'm not experiencing it? We move into it by faith, by humility, and by not only believing in him as Savior. Oh, I want to be saved from my consequences. I'll opt in for that. Oh, no, he's got to be Lord. It's when he told the, the 5,000, 
He said they wanted the loaves and the fishes. They wanted Jesus as Savior. But then he said, eat my flesh, drink my blood. He was not saying cannibalize me. He was saying, come into covenant with me and allow me to be Lord of your life. And they all left. No, thank you. We want Savior, but we don't want Lord. And then he turns around to the 12. He said, will you also go away? And Peter spoke very honestly. He said, well... If we knew anyone else that had the words of life, we would. But since you're the only guy we know that puts out tape series like these, we're going <laughs> to hang around, but we'd rather not. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Covenant relationship. Yeah. His lordship. Faith in his lordship. You're going to be in control. I'm going to do what I see the father do. And the father tells you to do something. Why would I do that? That'll put my job in jeopardy. My husband won't like that. My kids won't. My kids won't approve. That might cost me financially. Why would I? Why would I? No, he's in control. You tell your mind to sit down, shut up, and you go out and do what you see the father do. And all of a sudden, uh, Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14 starts going off in your life like a fireworks display. Yes, indeed. And yes, woohoo, God, thank you, what Jesus. What else could possibly go what right? What else could possibly go right? <laughs> Amen. So ask the Father. Yeah. We've been praying this in our prayer time this week. You know, when it's good to seek the Lord early because when you're awake real early, you know, the flesh is, is a lazy bum. And so the flesh, is, when it's wide awake, it's real good at making excuses. But whenever you get up early to pray, the flesh is still sleeping. You know, <laughs> so he's not awake enough to start making excuses. And we've been praying this week, God... Cleanse us from hidden faults. Anything, anything. You know, we can see your faults. We see stuff in you. Man, if you knew we saw it, you'd be embarrassed. Guess what? You see stuff in us too. That's right. Cleanse us from hidden faults. God, cleanse us from that which other people can see clearly, but that which we've blinded our eyes to. Yes. That's a cleanse point. us. Cleanse me, David said, from hidden faults. That's your highest choice. A blessing be in my life. Help me to cooperate with that. God told Kitty. Kitty was saying, God, I need some change. God said, give me some cooperation. I'll give you some change. And it works every time. And it begins with an honesty. With an honesty to see, are we excluding ourselves? If we're experiencing these consequences, it's not because he's excluded us. It's because we've excluded himself from the... We've, it's not because he's excluding us, but because we've excluded ourselves, ourselves from the benefits and blessings that he died to provide us. Father, we thank you oh, Jesus. for your word. Lord, what a difficult passage oh, to spend God. time in. How you love us. But it's still the word of God yes, that liberates, that frees. It's still the word of God whose purpose is geared to produce in us, Father, life and life more abundantly. God, cleanse us from hidden faults. Jesus. Cleanse us from those things by which we're grieving the Holy Ghost. Those things that make him wince and make him flinch mm. from his place of repose on the inside of us. Those things that make him take his keys out of his pocket and look toward the door Jesus. that are in our life. Jesus. Those things in our lives that, that, that distract him and make him wish he were somewhere else. Jesus. That don't reflect your character because you are such a good God that you took all of this wrath and you poured it out upon Jesus so that we could get be, so that you could get our attention just long enough to say I need a savior I can't do this by myself God that you would grant unto us what repentance looks like the message that you preach Jesus to repent what you were looking for in the people God we want you to get that from us today so that we can be completely extracted from verse 15 through 68 and totally immersed into verses 1 through 14. Yes. Father. Not as a carrot and stick routine, but because we realize we need a Savior. Yes, yes, yes. We, we are well schooled. God, we don't want to shoot spitballs at the teacher and say, we can't tell the teacher, we're not going to learn that chapter today. No, let the law be our teacher to bring us to Christ, that we might fully say, I need a Savior not any outward dependency will do. And we turn completely to you in humility, petitioning you for your mercy yes, that is abundantly God. available, Father. Yes, mighty God. In Jesus' name. How we love you. We Amen. Worship you. Amen.